this. All right. So guys, today what we're going to do is we are going to address, well, begin to address the question that Gavin laid out there a minute ago when he said, are they always going to give us these numbers, these delta H values for reactions? And guys, the answer is, you know, but they'll always give you enough information so that you can at least come up with them on your own. So when we talk about this, we talk about what's called calorimetry. I don't know why this door bothers me. Calorimetry in Hess's law. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about calorimetry. Um, then, guys, we're going to hit pause. I will lay out for you the entire homework assignment, um, but we won't be able to do it all. So we will not grade it Thursday. What we will do is we will come in on Thursday and we will then talk about Hess's law and then we'll grade that entire assignment on Monday. Now guys, some of, well, you won't even know the difference, but let me explain to you the method to my madness. And it goes like this, and I think you're gonna wanna write this down because it's nice to have all of this organized in your head. So it kind of goes like this. So guys, this is where you are as the result of the last homework assignment. You understand that we have these things that are called thermochemical equations. You've got some reactants, you've got some products. When they react together, we keep track of the energy change. And as a result, we can then assign an enthalpy value to the reaction. And I think that we understand that if that enthalpy, if that enthalpy value is negative, what does that tell us about the reaction? It's exothermic, it's giving off energy. And if that enthalpy value is positive, it's endothermic, it's taking in energy. Now again, guys, just to reinforce the idea, in order for that sign logic to make sense, what has to be our system? In order for negative enthalpies to be exo and positive enthalpies to be endothermic, what's our system? The reaction. The elements and, con well, really the elements that make up our reactants and products. In thermochemistry, almost all the time, I can't think immediately of an example where this would be different, the system is the reaction. Okay, so with that said, what is our frame of reference? Where are we in the system? And then it all makes sense. If we are the atoms of the reaction, and if we are losing energy to the surroundings, then our energy is going down, and that would be exothermic. And then conversely, if we're in the system, and if the surroundings are giving energy to us, our energy is going up, that would be positive, that would be endothermic. And again, guys, just because I know you're sick of it, what are the only two ways for that energy exchange to happen? Work and heat. And when we get rid of work, and how do we get rid of work? constant pressure container, which we call an open container. Now there's no work. What are we left with? Heat. And what do we call heat in the absence of work? Enthalpy. Go ahead. Constant pressure containers? Well, but understand that for a majority of the time, we don't even need to think about it. Really, the place where we need to think about it is in gas forming reactions. And so, kind of what we're doing is we're sort of describing a playground that we're never really gonna get the opportunity to play in. Um, I mean, we, we get a sense of why this all exists, but to be honest with you, it becomes a moot point as we move forward. It's not really a stumbling block that we're gonna have to deal with, which was kind of, the foundation of the conversation that we had a minute ago where you were really wanting to dig into PV work, it's just something we don't have to do in this class, and so we don't. Um, and really, the questions that you're going to be encountering relative to this on the test, just assume that we're all comfortable with that. It's really not a, a, a step in the process that they even really expect you to be able to think through or justify. So I know that's disappointing, but go get a degree in chemistry and you can fight with it later. So yeah, I should have introduced you. I'm sorry. And I totally can't pronounce your name. So would you just introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm Shalissa. Shalissa. I'm studying research teacher at Joy University this year. So this teacher is class. So guys, here's the bottom line. 
she's this close to having her bachelor's in chemistry. Um, so she is fresh out of the trenches. Um, she knows this stuff way better than me because she's, I mean, I know the little bit of chemistry that I still need to know in order to teach it to you. She's up to her neck in this stuff like I was back when I was in my 20s. So if you have questions or, hey, what's it like to be a college chemistry major or good night, or if you want to run, I mean, how long ago did you take PCHEM? Okay, so everything that you're wanting to really do the deep dive on is really the fundamentals of PCAM, and she could probably do a much better job of helping you knit. So take advantage of her, guys. Um, seriously, she's a great resource. You'll be here all year, right? Yeah. So um, please, yeah, uh, come say hi at some point, introduce yourself. She's a great resource. So guys, bottom line then is this. Are we good with this idea of thermochemical equations, signage, systems, surroundings, heat work, good? Okay, so now guys, we're gonna do the Gavin thing. Where do these numbers come from? And guys, when we talk about that, the question that we're asking is, where does enthalpy change data come from? So where does enthalpy change data come from? Well, guys, one of the answers to that is, is, is experimental. We can get energy change data from empirical sources, experimentation. Now, guys, when we do that, we are talking about something called calorimetry. You can actually become a calorimetric chemist. And you spend your life studying energy changes in reactions. The guy that runs the BYU 105 lab, well, 107 lab, Dr. Philip Brown, is actually a calorimetric chemist and also a really good guy with a really thick Australian accent. Do you know Dr. Brown? Did you have it? No? Yeah, great guy. Anyway, um, so you could do this. You could go, hey, I really like calorimetry. I want to go do that for the rest of my life. I don't advise it, but should you choose to go down that road, have fun. Um, so guys, we can get these, these data points from empirical evidence, or we can get them from what is called Hess's Law. Now guys, Hess's Law is a mathematical process, but what you're going to find out is that you need to be able to access the fundamentals of Hess's law both computationally and by manipulation. And I know that that doesn't mean a thing to you and it won't until Thursday. But guys, Hess's law is kind of a neat idea. It basically says if you can, you don't need to write this down, let me just lay it on you and we'll talk more Thursday. It basically says this, if you can break a journey down into a bunch of steps, and if you know things about those steps on the journey, you piece them all together and you can figure out something about the whole journey. So for example, if you're driving from here to Seattle, and if you drive to Boise, take a break, stay the night, and then drive to Seattle, if you know how far it was to Boise, and then if you know how far it was from Boise to Seattle, you now know how far it was from here to Seattle, right? Same idea here, that if you can break a reaction down into a series of steps, and if you know the energy changes of the steps, you can then figure out the energy change of the whole, the whole process. That is Hess's law. But guys, you've got to be able to do that both through what we call manipulation and computation, and we'll talk all about that on Thursday. Now, here's the problem, guys. I've got a sneaky way of teaching this to you. I'm going to teach you Hess's law first through manipulation. And you're going to go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach it to you computationally by doing another manipulation problem and tricking you into doing the computations. So guys, it's important that we do these together because if I taught you this one and then waited two class period or two days to teach you this one, you wouldn't make the connection. So guys, we are going to draw a line right here to separate this into two days. The problem is, is this is pretty short. You're going to have a fair amount of time for homework today. This is a pretty good sized day, but we're going to break it apart right here, which means today you're going to have some time for homework. You ready to go?
All right, so here we go. So guys, before we start getting into this, we need to talk about how are we going to deal with heat? Grab your AP equation sheets, crack them open. Go to the page 13 page. And not surprisingly, guys, there you have thermo and electrochemistry. You're going to find out that for us, they are very tightly interwoven, although we won't make a lot of those connections until March when we do electrochem. But guys, for now, we're going to focus on the pieces of this that we need for, for thermo. So guys, the bottom line is this. If you think about the question that we were picking apart with the wire, think about this with me. Think about that question where that wire was dumping energy into the gas, right? So without getting into that idea of the expansion, although we'll talk about it a little, here's the idea. We've got a gas, right? And there's a wire inside that gas and that wire is releasing energy. And as the wire releases energy, the energy went into the gas. And what effect did that energy have on the gas? Part one of the examples it expanded. Let's pretend that, let's not talk about that. What is the other thing that that energy did to the gas? It raised the temperature. Now guys, if you remember, we said something kind of weird a day ago, and we said that we cannot directly measure internal energy, right? So instead of that, what do we do? We measure changes, and how do we infer changes? What evidence do we have that energy has been added to a system? Well, it either gets bigger or its temperature goes up. That's what we're going to look at today. Guys, today we are going to make the connection between energy change and temperature change. So how do we do that? Well, guys, in order to do that, we need to talk about what are called heat capacities. Now, here's the deal, guys. I'm, we're going to talk about molar heat capacities for two reasons. One, it's important, and two, we need to know it for the lab second period. But guys, this is not the frame of reference that we will use on the test. So I'm going to lay that out. I'm just, this, this isn't the way to think about this on the test, but we'll give it to you anyway. So guys, molar heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one mole of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, does that make any of your ears itch a little? Yeah, McKay, was that you? Yeah. Guys, did any of the rest of you make that connection? It kind of sounds like the definition of a, a, a calorie, right? You may or may not know that a calorie is defined as the amount of energy to do what? Raise one gram of water's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, if nothing else, you're starting to make the connection that when we talk about energies, we actually are going to talk about energies in the frame of reference of causing things as temperature to change. But guys, this is a little bit different. It is not water necessarily, and it is not a gram, it is a mole. But the bottom line is this, guys, this sentence can actually be distilled to this. Maybe we should write it, it might make more sense if we put it like this, joules per mole Celsius. I don't like it on a line. It doesn't stand out as much. E, no, may, doesn't matter. I don't know. Maybe. Sure. Celsius. Probably. I know there's an answer. I just don't know the answer. Let's go with yes. Okay. All right. So guys, how does, and by the way, you probably figured this out. These are the units, right? For molar heat capacity. 
how do these units actually become the distillation of the sentence, the definition? So let's make the connection. It's the amount of energy. And guys, what are our units for energy? Joules needed to raise one mole of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. Get it? It's joules per mole Celsius degree. The number of joules needed to raise one mole, one Celsius degree. Okay? So guys, the other thing that you need to understand then is the abbreviation. And molar heat capacity is denoted C sub M. So now guys, let's play a little, a little Where's Waldo. Grab your AP equation sheets and find it on the page 13 side of the AP equation sheet. If you haven't figured this out yet, guys, the way that these sheets are organized is the left-hand side are the equations, the right-hand side are the constants. Do you see C sub M? It's not there. That's the point. Remember I told you that this was not the frame of reference you need for the AP test. This is not on the AP equation sheet because it's not the way we're going to think about this on the AP test. Again, guys, I only tee up this ball because we're going to be using this in lab, but understand this is not the frame of reference that we are going to use on the test. So guys, what are we going to do? We are going to talk about what is called specific heat capacity or specific heat. If you've taken physics, my suspicion is that this is the one that you are familiar with uh, via uh, physics. So guys, let me again lay the definition on you, and I think this is going to sound even more familiar. It's the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. Sounding a little more familiar? So again, guys, the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, if you understand that, well, even if you don't, take a swing at it, what are the units? Write, it, write them down. Put them in your notes. What are the units for specific heat? If you're thinking to yourself, how are we supposed to know that? If you understood the logic of this distillation, you should be able to do a similar distillation and come up with the units for specific heat. So let's talk. What would you come up with? Joules over gram Celsius degrees, right? The amount of energy measured in joules to raise one gram of a substance's temperature, one degree Celsius. Is that okay? Okay. Now, I'm guessing your ears are really starting to itch because now we're really getting close to the definition of a calorie, right? How is this different from the definition of a calorie? It's not water, but you ready for the big thought? What is the specific heat of water? One calorie, right? Make that connection. A calorie is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. That's a calorie. So one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Now, if specific heat is the amount of energy needed to raise any substance's temperature, one degree Celsius, then doesn't it make sense that the specific heat of water is one calorie? Does that make sense? You may want to write it down, but it would be easier to do if I gave you the abbreviation. And the abbreviation is C sub S, or just small c. And guys, small c is the way we're going to do this in, uh, on the AP sheet. The C sub S, I think, is the way they do it in the book. I don't want to spend the time to verify. But you just need to know little c. So guys, go find little c on, the, on your AP equation sheet. You got it?
I pray they didn't change it. Hey, they didn't change it. There was this period of time when the AP test was in revision, where it's like every time we turned around, they were using big C's, C sub M's, little C's, molar heat, specific, it was just, ah, I think we finally hit on something that's gonna be consistent for a while. So guys, you see it there? C is the specific heat capacity of a substance. You good? And again, what is the specific heat capacity of water? One calorie. You got all of that? You guys all good? So guys, let's talk about this for just a second before we go on. So you understand that the specific heat of water is one gram joule per gram per Celsius degree. Is that a lot or a little? Guys, it's crazy huge. The specific heat of water is freakishly high. But guys, guess what? If the specific heat of water was not freakishly high, we wouldn't be here because life depends on earth of having water with a freakishly high specific heat. Because guys, why does the specific heat of water being freakishly high allow us to be alive? What's the connection? Say it again. Exactly. Guys, it acts as a temperature moderator for our planet. Our planet is mostly water. And guys, it works as what is called a heat sink. Our oceans absorb bamboozles of energy. Don't quote me on that. During the day and then re-radiate it at night. And the reason that works is because water has such an amazing ability to absorb thermal energy. If you don't get it, have any of you been down like the shoulder season, especially this is true in the fall. If you've ever been to Arches in like November, uh, maybe more like October, you ever been down there? What's it like in the day down there? stinking hot. It's like 90 degrees still. You're down there going, ah, I'm going to die. And then the sun sets and the temperature falls through the floor. Why? It's all sand. And guys, sand has a very low specific heat. It doesn't absorb a lot of the energy from the sun, so it all just gets re-radiated to us and we end up getting all hot. And then at night, the temperature plummets because there's no source of energy. Now, you ever been to LA in January? You ever been to LA in June? It's the same, right? It is 68 degrees in LA all the time. Why? Because they're on the ocean. And during the day, the ocean absorbs all this energy so it doesn't get that hot. And then at night, it re-radiates the energy so it doesn't get that cold. You ever notice that, guys? that in the desert, the temperature swings are enormous, but on the coast, the temperature doesn't fluctuate much. It's because of the specific heat of water. Huh? Absolutely, that's the whole idea. Okay. So guys, you okay with the ideas behind all of this? You guys are groovy? All right. So now, guys, what we're ready to do is we are ready to talk about something called coffee cup calorimetry. This is where we're going to end the day. I understand that in Utah County, this doesn't have the same meaning that it does in the rest of this planet. So we will call it hot chocolate cup calorimetry. We used to call it postum cup calorimetry, but apparently y'all don't drink postum anymore. So then you know what postum is. It's that nasty stuff your grandpa drinks. Yeah, I don't even think they make it anymore. They know they do. <laughs> okay. But guys, understand, understand that coffee cup calorimetry is actually what is called constant pressure calorimetry. But if you were to go up to any studying chemist and say coffee cup calorimetry, they would go, I get what you're talking about. So understand that while it sounds slang, it is actually accepted. So guys, here's what we're going to do with coffee cup calorimetry. Do you remember our little flow chart? And we said, hey, yo, there's delta H's. Where do they come from? And then we said experimentation. And then we said math, Hess's law. Guys, today what we're going to do by talking about coffee cup calorimetry is we're going to run out the left side of that flow chart and we're going to talk about empirically where do these delta H values come from. Now to do that, please don't try to draw this yet. Guys, this is a coffee cup calorimeter. 
just sort of let this soak in for a second and take a look at what you got. You've got a styrofoam cup, typically two, we'll nest them together for better insulation. You've got a thermometer and a stirrer, and then you've got a sample of a substance in a basically cup of water, okay? So guys, those are the fundamentals of coffee cup calorimetry. Now understand that it used to be that we had to teach another type of calorimetry, and it is still in your book. It's called bomb calorimetry. You no longer need to know bomb calorimetry, so we're just going to study the one that you do still need to know, which is coffee cup calorimetry. Now guys, for those of you that are in the second period lab, we're going to do two of these labs. They're actually kind of interesting. Um, but regardless, this is what you need to know about coffee cup calorimetry. You guys all okay? You good on the picture? You sort of have a sense of it? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to redraw it. Do this with me in your notes. So in order to have a coffee cup calorimeter, first thing you need is a coffee cup. Then on that coffee cup, you need a lid then penetrating that lid, oh boy, you need a thermometer, oh boy, and you need a stirry thing. What am I missing? Water in a sample. And then you need so, ah, oh, poop. I hate it when it does that. I think I'm okay. Then we need some water. And then, guys, we'll talk about this. Well, we'll talk about the sample in a minute. It doesn't necessarily need to have that sample. Okay. So now, are you, are you guys all okay? Are you all caught up with me? You know what? Actually, hold on. I'm going to do this. This is going to take, oh yeah. I'm realizing that my space could be better utilized if I did something a little different. So just a second. And then for those of you that need another moment, we can buy that for you. Um, so let's do this. Let's quit out of this. Exit that. Grab this. Nope, don't do that. Go here. Do this. Do this. Go here. We'll go stick with red. I'm going to just move this over a little bit, y'all, just because um, it'll make better use of space. You're okay if yours is in the middle. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, guys, with this, there are some, some questions, I guess, that you need to be able to, to think through. And I'm just going to sort of lay lie them out out here, and then we're going to talk about them one at a time. So guys, first of all, when we talk about this, we need to understand what is our system and what is our surroundings. Then, once we've defined our system and our surroundings, we need to talk about what these are useful for, and then we need to understand the mathematics behind it. So in order to really wrap your head around coffee cup calorimetry, these are the things that we need to talk about. In a coffee cup calorimeter, what is your system? What is your surroundings? What are these things good for? And how does the math work? You guys all caught up? You're okay? Okay, so guys, let's talk about it. I'm going to give you the first one. Here's the deal. The, uh, the, the system for a coffee cup calorimeter are the atoms in the reactants and the products. It's the reaction. Now, I don't want to define that any further yet. That's RCT for reactant. I don't want to define that anymore yet 
because we'll talk about it more when we get down to what is this useful for. So guys, rather than defining those terms, let's skip down a line because I think once you understand what the surroundings are, this is going to make more sense. So guys, if I, if I hadn't drawn you the picture, and if I just came to you, because you guys already understand system and surroundings, and if I just came to you and I said, if your system is the reactants and products, then what's the surroundings? Everything else, right? We have this idea that the system, well, the system plus the surroundings is the universe. So once we understand what the system is, everything else is the surroundings. Yeah? Okay. Yes, but practically no. So let's talk practically now. So guys, when we talk about the surroundings, I didn't cuss when my lab blew up, but I'm about to cuss now. So guys, the surroundings are the water. Is the water? Are the, the, it's the water. So now you're saying to yourself, hold on a second. Now you're saying to yourself, wait, how can that be? I thought that the system... Once we define the system, everything else was the surroundings. Well, guys, we're doing something tricky. And understand that, that while it's maybe technically inappropriate, it's functionally useful. So, guys, in these conversations that we've been having about system and surroundings, how do the system and the surroundings play together? What do they do? They swap energy. How do they swap energy? Work and heat, right? We got rid of work, so now it's just heat. But the idea is this, guys, that when we talk about calorimetry, we are going to be studying exchanges of heat. Now, guys, if our reactants and products are our system, as they react together, especially given the picture that we saw earlier that was a little more detailed, as the reactants, the object, if you will, the system, as that reaction goes on, where does the heat go? Into the water. So guys, the idea here then is that as this reaction takes place, what's going to happen is the system and the surroundings are going to... Ex oh, I don't want to do it that way. Sorry. The system and the surroundings, let's use the actual abbreviation, the system and surroundings are going to exchange energy in the form of heat. By Q. But guys, understand that that's really not the case, right? So watch. Say that we've got a reaction. Here's, here's our system and our, there, there's our stuff. There's our reactants. And this reaction is going on. And say that this reaction is exothermic. So if this reaction is losing energy, where does the energy go? Into the water and the thermometer and the stirrer and the air and the styrofoam and eventually out into the room, right? Yeah. The reality here, guys, is that that's not actually the way that this works. But we make some assumptions. First of all, why do we use a styrofoam cup rather than a metal cup? It doesn't absorb energy very well, right? So the styrofoam cup, think about it this way, insulates the universe from the universe, insulates the surroundings from the universe. So by using a styrofoam cup, we can say, if we can enclose this in styrofoam, then we can limit our universe to just what's inside the cup. Is that okay? Now what about this? What about the glass and the metal of the stirrer? Well, guys, these things have relatively low specific heats. Consequently, they don't absorb a lot of energy. So when this reaction loses energy, it's going to dump that energy in the thing that is best able to absorb the energy, which is what? The water. So guys, and understand, in order for this idea to work, we are in fact making some assumptions. We are assuming that energy cannot escape through the coffee cup, and we're assuming that the amount of energy absorbed by the thermometer and the stirrer are negligible. Get the idea? 
So you may want to write those things down. In order to keep track of the numbers, we are assuming that the coffee cup itself, the, the cup doesn't absorb heat, and we are assuming that the energy absorbed by the, the bits, the thermometer and the stirrer, are negligible. But then, guys, if that works, then these become equal, right? If, in fact, we can say that no energy is lost to the surroundings, because it's insulated, and if the energy gained by the thermometer and the stirrer are negligible, then, guys, we can say this. The energy lost or gained by the system will be equal to the energy gained or lost by the water. Get the idea? So then, guys, all we've got to do is this. Watch my hands. If we can measure the amount of energy lost or gained by the water, what is that equal to? The amount of energy gained or lost by the reaction. Get it? So guys, if the temperature of the water goes up, what happened to the reaction? It lost energy. How much energy did it lose? Same as the water gained. And guys, if the water gets colder, then what happened to the energy of the, of, the, of the reaction? It went up because this, wait, went down. Wait, down, down, temperature. So if energy goes up, this lost energy, if this goes, this goes, yeah, okay, that goes up. Okay, good, okay. So, but we understand that they're opposites of each other. You get the idea? Okay. So then guys, what about this? What kind of reactions would this be useful for? Actually, no, no. You can't burn stuff underwater, kiddos. <laughs> so guys, <laughs> so guys, what kind of reactions would this be useful for? Aqueous reactions. Anything that happens aqueously, you can do in a coffee cup calorimeter. You okay? So now, guys, let's talk about the math. So, why do we need the thermometer in the first place? Is it going to measure it, but just not alter it so much? Good question. And that's where we're headed next. So, guys, you tell me that you're comfortable with this idea, right? The energy lost by the reaction is equal to the energy gained by the water and vice versa, right? So now here's the question. And think through this with me. How does the energy get from the reaction to the water? Through what avenue? Heat, right? No work, only heat. So if the energy is being transferred from the reaction to the water via the avenue of heat, what can we actually measure to figure out how much energy that water is gaining or losing? What actually will change about the water that we can measure? It's temperature, and that's why we need the thermometer. So what we're going to do is this. Guys, watch, and I think this will make sense. This reaction is giving off energy. Where does the energy go? Into the water. How do we know the water is gaining energy? Its temperature goes up. So guys, the logic goes like this. You ready? If we can measure how much the temperature goes up, we can then calculate how much energy the water gained. But we know that the, water, the energy gained by the water is equal to the energy lost by the reaction, and consequently, we can figure out the amount of energy lost by the reaction. Does that make sense? So now the question is this. How does that math work? If we measure the temperature change, how do we then calculate the amount of energy gained by the water? And the answer is this. This is the equation you need to know. Q, which is what? Heat, the amount of energy lost or gained, the, the heat, um, and I want to make sure I write it just like this, is equal to M, which is what? Mass. C, which is what? Specific heat capacity. And then delta T, which is what? Change in temperature. Now, guys, here's the way this plays out. In order to figure out how much energy, how much heat was gained by the water, we need to know the mass of the water 
and we need to know the temperature change of the water. And then we need to know the specific heat of water. And guys, if you grab your uh, thingamadunker here. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Interesting. Did they just mistakenly put it somewhere else? <laughs> Wow. So, and it's not embedded in the equations. Maybe they just expect you to know it. Well, then I'd better give it to you. Guys, the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram per Celsius degree. You ready for a deep thought? 4.18 joules is equal to a calorie. Wrap your head around that. You guys all okay? Can this go away? Not yet. How about now? Okay. So guys, let me do this then. I got to clean this mess up. why this keeps doing this. Okay, so guys, with all of that said then, we're going to solve this problem. So you've got a three and a half gram sample of solid sodium hydroxide. You dissolve that in a calorimeter with 100 grams of water and the temperature of the water goes from here to there. Calculate the delta H for the process in kilojoules per mole. Assume that this is a perfect calorimeter and the specific heat of water, the solution is the same as the specific heat of water. So guys, this should take you about five minutes. I'll give you some time to work on it, then we'll do it together. Again, guys, don't be forming bad habits. If you read this problem and go, I have no stinking idea even where to begin, guess what? That's what you're gonna feel like for every question that you sit down to on the AP test. So what you're doing right now is you're training yourself to give up. So if you read this question and go, I don't know, Knappenberger's gonna solve it in five minutes, it's a waste of my time to try, Understand that Knappenberger is not going to be in the library when you take your AP test. And what you're doing is you're training yourself to be helpless. So guys, train yourself to be aggressive. If you don't know what to do, dig in. Start circling things that you know. Start a second. Start writing down things. I'm going to let you just solve it. I don't want to answer questions. Start write down equations. Write a balanced equation. Do something. Because guys, if you train yourself to give up the minute you're, you go, I, I don't know, I'm done. Give me the $85 for the test and I can use it better than you. Did you have, is it a question we need to talk about? Uh, I'm going to let you fiddle with that. We'll talk about it in a minute. Guys, I guess I was wrong. You're not going to have a lot of time for homework.
I sat down, tried to solve the problem, got stuck. Guess what I did? Drew a picture. Better than nothing. Sigma? We're not looking at those right now. Let's, we'll, we'll talk about it next time. Are you already done? Guys, let's go for about another two minutes. How you doing over there, Vanessa? Oh, good. So, guys, let's go for about another 45 seconds. take a crack at it are we okay so guys interestingly for those of you that are in second period this is the lab we're gonna do in not the next one but the one after I'm just gonna give you all a bunch of salts well each group gets its own salt and you get to go do this stuff so let's talk a little bit about what's going on here before we start talking about the math so the idea is this, you've got a calorimeter, what's in the calorimeter? 100 grams of water. Then what do you do? You drop in 3.25 grams of solid sodium hydroxide. And what does the sodium hydroxide do? It dissolves, right? Strong electrolyte, it dissolves. Now, as it dissolves, does it give off energy or does it take in energy? How do you know it gives off energy? temperature of the water goes up. And guys, that can be confusing. People think that if temperature is going up, then energy is going up. It is for the water, but what about for the system? It's going down. The, the energy of the system is going down. But guys, the idea is that the amount of energy that's being absorbed by the water is equal to the amount of energy that's being lost by the sodium hydroxide. So if we can calculate how much energy is gained by the water, we know the amount of energy lost by the sodium hydroxide. So how do we calculate the amount of energy gained by the water? Q is equal to MC delta T. Is that okay? Okay, so here we go. So we go Q is equal to mc delta t, or q is equal to m. 
What's the mass? Is it 100? Is it 3.25? Or is it 100.325? The question is, what are we looking at? So we want to know the amount of energy gained by the surroundings, which is the water. So it's only the mass of the water. So it's 100.0 grams. Now we need to know the specific heat, 4.18 joules per gram per Celsius degree, which apparently they expect you to memorize. And then guys, the temperature change, good night, 8.1. Look at me doing math in my head. Okay. So now if you're interested, look at the way the units cancel. Grams cancel, degrees Celsius cancel, you're left with joules. So, 100, 4.18, probably could have done that easier, times 8.1, and I get, what, two significant digits? 3,400 joules. Yeah? No. Guys, all that we have calculated is the amount of energy gained by the water. Which is equal to what? The amount of energy lost by the sodium hydroxide as it dissolved. But now we got a problem. It says calculate delta H. And it says calculate delta H in these units, kilojoules per mole. So now we're going to come down here and we're going to say, okay, this problem is requesting kilojoules per mole. So what do I know that's like kilojoules per mole? Well, I know joules per what? How many grams? 3.25 grams. So guys, where did those 3,400 joules of energy come from? the solution of 3.25 grams of sodium hydroxide. So this is joules per 3.25 grams of sodium hydroxide. Now we can go 1,000 joules is 1 kilojoule. 23, 16, and 1 is 40. 40.0 40 grams is 1 mole of sodium hydroxide. Now we can do some math. 3,400 divided by 3.25, divided by 1,000 times 40. And again, two significant digits, I get 42 kilojoules per mole. Second. Let me make my point and then I'll answer questions. Are you guys good? Okay, I will wait. I'd rather not because I'm afraid you're gonna steal my thunder. You guys okay? Good? Are we done? It's wrong. Guys, if you wrote all of this work down on the AP test, guess how much credit you would get? None. Why? It's negative. Whole problem worth one point, you forget the negative and it's zero. So let's talk about why it's negative. Guys, what we are being asked to calculate is delta H. Delta H is the energy change for what? The system. So where did we go wrong? Well, guys, this is in fact positive, but that's the energy change for the water, the surroundings. And we've got to understand that if the surroundings were gaining energy, then the energy of the system, the energy change for the system is correspondingly negative. So it would have to be a negative delta H in kilojoules per mole. Yeah, so the idea is this. We got to the point where we figured out the numerical value, 42 kilojoules per mole. The problem is, is that it's also negative. The reason is because the, the system, the sodium hydroxide, is losing energy. How do we know the sodium hydroxide is losing energy? Because the water heated up. Is that... Is that Go ahead, go ahead. 
Yeah, what? Yeah. It's Nick, it's Nick, it's Nick, it's Nick, it's I was canceled. I was canceled. Oh. Yeah. If that's the that's worst the thing I think I do to these materials, I'm going to count it a counter victory. You guys okay? You guys okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Why? Why? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, but yeah, I understand, understand that they hold your hand that fire on the AP test. The, so let's talk about it. What do you have to be able to do on the AP test for significant digits? And the answer is you have to be within one significant digit on either side of the correct answer. Okay? So we would be fine. You guys okay? So let's do homework before the bell rings. And then, guys, I'll be straight with you. I haven't printed your pride reports yet, so we're going to be a little late getting out of here. So guys, this is your homework. Here's the problem. You ain't going to be able to do it all. So do what of it you can. We will not grade it on Thursday. We'll get into the computational stuff on Thursday.